Mother's Day, and to all the mothers out there, uh, Happy Mother's Day. But today is not a Mother's Day sermon. It is, however, a sermon that will continue our series on the role of women in the church. And as we said in the in the series opener last month, when we talked about Tabitha, when we talk about the role of women in the church, we often deal with what women cannot do. Instead, and that's good from time to time because we are facing error in this world as to churches believing that women can do things that God has not given them that role to do. However, when we only focus on that, we leave out the fact that women are part of the church, do have a role to play, and women can sometimes be felt saying, well, what can I do if I can't preach, if I can't lead uh, the congregation in song or around the table is what else is there to do? And I think that's a short-sighted view of what the church is. But we're going to be looking at in this series, as we looked at with Tabitha last month, women in the Bible, character traits that women had, and how women can emulate those, and men can uh, also be encouraged as well. These aren't women-only traits. But these are things that women can do. And so in honor of today, we are going to continue this series. The title is, which is cut off again, because I made it too long across the screen, Being Strong Like Deborah. Deborah has an H at the end. So strength can come in many forms. We sometimes think of strength as physical strength. The ability to lift things, pull things, or work with heavy objects. That's not the strength we're talking about. You do not have to be physically strong to be a Christian, and so we're going to put that off to the side. We can have mental strength, the ability to be confident, the refusal to be intimidated. Someone can be mentally strong. And although Deborah will exhibit some of that, that's really not what we're going to be talking about either. What we are going to be talking about is strength of character. The desire to do what is right and the will to carry it out. So what I'd like us to look at for a few moments this morning is how Deborah possessed strength of character and how the women and the men can use this part of her character and apply that in our lives. And the women can take that role and say, okay, this is what I'm to do in the church. I am to be a woman of strong character. And so, let's deal with the background of Deborah a little bit. And for that, we're going to be in the book of Judges. We're going to be a lot in the beginning in Judges chapter 4, so you can turn there. Judges chapter 4, we're going to read the first five verses to begin with. When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hatzor. The commander of the, his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Harasheth Hagoyim. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now, in the book of Judges, if you start reading all the way in chapter 1 and you go all the way through the end of the book, you're going to find a constant cycle. You're going to find a cycle where Israel falls into sin. <coughs> Israel suffers the consequences for that sin. They repent, seek God to deliver them. God sends them a judge. God delivers them. And then they, then they have a period of peace, a period of um, prosperity in certain cases. But then it starts all over again. You had Othniel, then you had Ehud, then you have Shamgar, but when you take a look at the timeline in Judges, Shamgar, Deborah, and the next judge, Gideon, all really judge 
around the same time. We often think of the judges as judging all of Israel. They really had specific areas they judged. Some were on the east side of the Jordan. Some were on the west. Some might have been in Judah. Some might have been in the north. And so uh, there were multiple judges sometimes judging at the same time. And when we fail to realize that, then we, then we come into timeline problems later. We're going to be focusing on Deborah. Deborah uh, is going to be judging about 150 years into the period of the judges. So between chapters 1 through 4, we have traveled ahead in time about 150 years, or about 200 years, since Joshua led Israel over the Jordan River to conquer Canaan. Deborah herself is the fourth judge in this book, and she is the only woman who will be used as a judge by God in this book. It says she judges Israel at the palm tree between Bethel and Ramah in the tribes of Benjamin and Ephraim. We think of buildings. We have buildings today. If you want to go see the judge, you go to the courthouse. Well, there were no courthouses then. You had landmarks she went to, and she judged under the palm tree in Bethel. This map may be harder to see. It's probably harder to see on the handout, but it is there. Uh, if you want a clearer picture, it is handed out at the, uh, at the end of the week. So up here we have, this is Israel. This is the tribe of Benjamin, a large portion of it. Here's Gibeon, where the Gibeonites were. Here's Mizpah and Ramah. That's where Samuel was. But in between Ramah and Bethel, which is disputed as to whether where in this region it is, there was a palm tree, and Deborah was known to be there, and she would judge Israel. This is what the land looks like today. Let's remember Israel's not flat. Uh, this sort of gives us that picture that this is, this is hilly land here. So it's not just easy to walk up to Deborah uh, and just say, all right, I need, I need uh, this, to be, this situation to be judged by you, or I need the word of the Lord come to you. They had to travel to come to her. And so that's, this is where uh, she judged, somewhere in this region here. A lot of people like to use the fact that Deborah was a judge and... Therefore, it is okay to have women preachers today. A lot of the times you'll go back, you will tell people, well, God in the New Testament said that men are to lead the congregation as elders and deacons, and preachers, that, that they're to do those things. And they'll say, well, what about Deborah? Deborah was a prophetess, and she was. Deborah was used by God, and she was. Deborah didn't sin when she did that? No, she didn't. But we have to look and understand why Deborah was used. And I think we can get that from the story itself as to why Deborah was used. She is the only woman in a period of about 350 years that is going to be a judge. It's not that there weren't righteous women between Deborah and Samuel or Joshua and Samuel, there were many righteous women. But Deborah is the only judge, and we have to ask ourselves, why? Because if we understand why that is, then we can maybe understand a little bit about why, about why, in the New Testament, even though women have a role in the church, they do not have this role. And so, let's, let's seek to answer that question. Why was Deborah a judge in Israel? So let's read verses 6 to 8 of Judges chapter 4. Judges 4, beginning of verse 6. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor? Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali, and the sons of Zebulun, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitudes, and his multitudes at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand. And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. What we find here is that Deborah calls Barak. Barak is the commander of the army. <coughs> Deborah's not the commander. Barak is. And she says, God has commanded you, she in her capacity as judge, 
to raise up an army and go to Mount Tabor with 10,000 troops. And you're going to attack Sisera there. If you want to know where we are, all right, Deborah is down here at Bethel Ramah. That's where we, I gave, gave you the picture earlier. That's further on down the map. We're coming up here into the Jezreel Valley. Mount Tabor is here. This is where Barak was to come from. Here's the tribes of Issachar, Zebulun, and Naphtali comes up by the Sea of Galilee, which is here. Sisera and the Canaanites were going to come up here, and Barak and the, and the Israelites were to come and meet him there. This is what the land actually looks like if you were to take a look at it today. You have Mount Tabor here. This is where Barak was to come from. You have the Hill of Morah here. That's where you, you find Israel battling a lot in this valley. Jephthah fought, fought in this valley. Not Jephthah. Gideon fought in this valley. Saul died in this valley. King Saul died in this valley. And this is what it looks like today. There's this plain, and then there's a bunch of mountains here. And that it provided a very good fighting ground uh, for battles. Because you think about horses and chariots and 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 fighting in general, if you're fighting through mountains, it's not very easy to fight. Whereas if you're on a big plane, yes, it's, it's much easier. And so this is what Deborah told Barak to do, and that should have been enough. Deborah was the judge of God. She was a prophetess. She said, this is what the Lord has said to you for you to do. Barak should have said, yes, I will do that. But he didn't. He said, Deborah, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you won't, I won't do that. This shows a lack of male leadership in Israel at the time. Even when you come to Gideon, which is at the same time period, Gideon almost had to be dragged kicking and screaming by God to go out and fight the Midianites. He had to have, I think it was three signs. God, When God appeared to him, God had to stay for a meal. Then I'll know. Then he had the fleece. And then, even then, God had to send him into the camp of the Midianites. And only then, when he heard of their fear, that he had enough strength to go and fight them. Three signs for Gideon. Lack of male leadership in Israel. And so God used Deborah... Because of that lack of leadership, I believe. And Deborah was the type of person who would not let a lack of leadership stand in the way of obeying God. She knew what the word of the Lord was, and she was going to say, she wasn't going to allow Barak to not follow. So Deborah cannot be used as a justification for women preachers today, because we do have a special circumstance in Israel at the time where it seems that the men didn't want to step up. And so God used who he could to accomplish his purpose of delivering Israel here. But this, so far we haven't really talked about the strength and character of Deborah. That beca that's because it comes later. <coughs> Let's now continue in Judges 4, beginning at verse 9. So she, being Deborah, said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in, in, in the journey you are taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. He went up with 10,000 men under his command, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the turban tree in Zanim, which is beside Kedesh. And they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him from Harashat Hagoyim to the river Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him, and the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot, 
But Barak pursued the chariots and the armies as far as Harashat Hagayim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. As we said before, Deborah wasn't going to allow the word of the Lord to go unheeded. She was not going to allow Barak and his fear and lack of courage and cowardice to get in the way of God delivering Israel. So she told Barak, fine, I'll go with you, but let it be known. God is not going to give you Sisera. He is going to deliver Sisera into the hand of a woman. Now it's even true today. Men don't like to be outdone by women. Especially in, 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 in um, feats of strength, in war, in battle. It's seen as an insult if a woman is stronger than a man. It's not really an insult, but especially the people that day. If God gave Sisera into the hand of a woman, that was quite a rebuke to Barak for his cowardice. But God wasn't going to give credit to the ones who didn't have courage to lead. Note here, again, Deborah wasn't the commander of the army, nor do I believe the passage says Deborah fought in the battle. Barak and Israel did this. Barak was the commander and Israel fought. She was the judge and she even had to give Barak the instructions, go now, today's the day God has delivered him. And so this is the battlefield we have. So here's Mount Tabor again. We have Barak coming here. We have Sisera and the 900 chariots coming from the south southwest. And they come and meet around here. And lo and behold, there was the rout. Israel, Barak obeyed, and Israel won. Barak, and the, Barak defeated the armies of the Canaanites. They fled this way and were pursued by Barak. However, if you notice up here, this little, little arrow up here, Sisera didn't go with them. Sisera, their commander, fled in the opposite direction in order to save his life. I find that interesting that Sisera abandoned his army. He was the commander of it, and he abandoned it. He allowed them to die, but he didn't want to die. And so this is what this is what we have here. Deborah, though, was strong enough in character. She was determined enough that she was going to make sure Israel followed the word of the Lord. And so she came with Barak. She told Barak what to do, and Barak succeeded because God delivered. Now, there is part of the story I'd like us to quickly deal with that we cannot emulate Deborah over. The first part is not really Deborah herself. The second part is in how she describes this. If we go, to, if we go back to seven, uh, verse chapter 4, verses 17 to 24, we're going to find out what happened to Sisera. Starting at verse 17. However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, Jamin, king of Hazor, and of the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. And when he had turned aside into her tent, she covered him with a blanket. Then he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a jug of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him. And he said to her, stand at the door of the tent, and if any man come and inquires of you and says, Is there any man here? You shall say no. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple, and it went down into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. And then as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera, dead with the peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued the Jabin, the king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So we have Sisera here. And he's fleeing, and he comes to this woman, Jael. Jael is the wife of Heber the Kenite. Heber the Kenite is one of the descendants of those who would have been related to Moses. And evidently they had some sort of peace treaty with the Canaanites uh, so that 
uh, they at least wouldn't be afflicted. And Jael came out and meet him and says, you can come in here. Peace here. You're safe here. And, and Sisera felt at home here, or at least safe enough to fall asleep. Now, he told her to lie. If anyone comes, uh, tell, tell them that I'm not here. Well, that's wrong. Well, we, we can't lie. But whether or not Jael had the intention when he got there to kill him, or whether she got that courage later, I do not know. But what she did do is rather gruesome. She took a rather long tent peg. If you've gone, to, if you've gone um, camping and have had to pitch a tent where you've had to put the tent actually pegged into the ground, you probably know what the length of those pegs are, and this would have been made of metal, not plastic. And she took a hammer, and she had to be pretty strong to take that hammer and sneak up on the man. And you're, you're not going to get more than one blow to do that. You have to take the hammer pretty hard, hit him right in the middle of the forehead, to hammer him to the ground. That was that, that's not a very nice way to die. But uh, that's, the, that's what she did. And he died. So we often think, well, God said he would deliver him into the hand of Deborah, and that's possible. But Jael's a woman, too. And, and so, in effect, what happened here is she murdered Sisera. Jael wasn't a judge. She wasn't a prophetess. She had no authority to kill even an enemy. But what she did do is she had the courage to take action. Now, we sometimes would come along and read something in Scripture and say, well, if, if someone took action and good came from it, therefore what was done must have been good. That's not always the case. And we need to remember the Bible is inspired of God, but it tells us the truth. It tells us what people actually did. It doesn't justify sin. Just because we read of someone doing something doesn't mean the thing they did automatically was good. Even if a something good came out of it in the end. We need to remember that. Jael murdered this man. She murdered this man in his sleep. He deserved to die, yes. But God didn't give under the law of Moses the right for personal vengeance. She was not in danger of being killed. The man was asleep. She could have called Barak in, just like he did. Arrest this man. Kill him in battle. Barak would have had the, had the right as part of the army, with Israel being in, at war, to execute Cicero. Jael took the matter into her own hands, and she murdered which we cannot condone as saying, well, that's okay just because good came from it. And nor do I believe that, that's, that God told her to kill Sisera. We don't read of that, so we should not assume that either. But getting back to Deborah, uh, we got to skip to chapter 5, and her account of this in the Song of Deborah. We're only going to read three verses, four verses in the Song of Deborah, Chapter 5, verses 24 to 27. Most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite. The Canaanite. Blessed is she among women in tents. He asked for water, she gave him milk, which would mean she did more. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. She stretched her hand to the tent peg, her right hand to the workman's hammer, and pounded Sisera. She pierced his head. She split and struck through his temple. At her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. At her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. So this song is a song of victory. It's a lot like the song of Moses when Israel, or well, the song of the sea, when Israel crossed over and all the, uh, the Philistine army that was chasing him was drowned in the, in the, in the uh, Red Sea. And they sang a song of victory, a song of praise to God. And that's what this is. It is a song of victory, a song of praise to God. It is a song sang by Deborah, praising the Lord, and even chastising Israel, who didn't come out into battle. She chastises, where were you other tribes when we went out into battle? 
Not everyone in Israel came out to battle. The middle of that chapter is a chastisement of Israel. And so, really, what is being talked about here in verses 24 to 27 is Jael's action versus the rest of Israel's inaction. That's what's being contrasted here. And if we just take these verses out of context and say that Deborah is necessarily praising Jael, I believe she is in a sense, but we need to recognize that hey, this is part of a song. She is stating the facts, but the mention of this act still doesn't justify it. Even if it appears that Deborah is doing so. But we must remember, who sang the song? Deborah did. Was it inspired? It could be. But it doesn't necessarily have to be. Just because it's recorded in scripture, which is inspired of God, doesn't mean everything that every prophet said was inspired of God. And we need to remember that. Nathan the prophet told David to go build the temple. He wasn't speaking the words of the Lord, even though he was a prophet. When God is described, I'm positive the prophet is going to speak correctly. She is not saying God told Jael to do this. She is stating what Jael did. She is saying that Jael was willing to act where you cowards were not. But we cannot justify the act that Jael actually took. She could have dealt with Sisera other ways and been completely right. If we see in scripture a passage that makes it seem like God approves of murder or something evil like that, we can know that that part at least wasn't from God. I don't believe the song necessarily is completely inspired of God, but it is recorded for us because the Bible records for us things that happened, whether they are good or whether they are bad. But Deborah was praising Jael for her willingness to act. We can't praise her for how she acted. And if Deborah was praising her for how she acted, we cannot emulate that either. Why might Deborah have praised Jael? Well, I believe that uh, what, uh, I believe that has to do with what we at the beginning of the book, what we have at the end of the book. In Judges 21, 25, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. This is what Israel, this is what, this statement here is how Israel got themselves into trouble more often than not. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so, while the judges did much good, at times they acted in ways they should not have acted. Samson did, Jephthah did, Gideon did, even here Deborah seems to have. So we can emulate parts of her character that are righteous, but we need to remember these people are human too. And they do not always act in a righteous way. So what lessons can we learn quickly before we have to close this? this well, it's now this afternoon. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. We can learn the first lesson. God has a place for women in the kingdom. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs, according to the promise. All people, man included, do not have the same role in the kingdom. Everyone has a different role. Deborah is an example of that. She wasn't a commander of the army of Israel. Was she therefore not important? No. If it wasn't for her, the commander of the army of Israel wouldn't have gone out into battle. She was very important to Israel. But her role at that time was a judge and a prophetess. Women may not have the same role as men, but you do have a role in the advancement of the kingdom and the work involved in it. But no one ever think for a second, that somehow women are second-class citizens in Christ's church. They just don't have the same role. So that's one lesson. Second lesson we can learn is women need to have a strong character to do what God desires even in the face of weak men. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1-4, to 4, Peter says, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even 
Even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very present, precious sorry, in the sight of God. Women aren't simply to be submissive to the Christian husbands. They are to be submissive to their husbands. And that, that point is made quite clear here, because there are some husbands who are not Christians. Why are they to do that? Because they are to be an example of how a Christian woman is to behave. So that people who see that will change their actions based on the righteous actions of a faithful woman. Often we say actions speak louder than words. I can say a thousand words up here in a sermon. And I have no idea if you guys are listening. I do have some idea, but I, I, don't, I don't know how much you're taking in. However, I would know when I go out and see how you act. If you act the way the Bible says, then you're listening. You're paying attention. Because others are going to see how you act and perhaps even become Christians themselves. Women are to focus the attention on their heart rather than simply their outward appearance for beauty fades. What's in the heart remains. Hospitality, kindness, all of the other physical attributes, but the spiritual attributes as well. How can you win your husband by your conduct if you don't know what God wants you to do? Deborah went with Barak even though she shouldn't have had to so that God's word could be fulfilled. And she won Barak. Barak wasn't her husband, but he was the commander in Israel. Barak was a weak man being pushed by a strong woman. If fathers won't teach their children about God, that doesn't mean a woman gives up their children to the world. She can teach their, her children about God. If the men leading the church won't stand for truth, that doesn't mean a woman can't stand for truth, even if not in a leadership role. If men won't go out and spread the gospel, and even if they will, but especially if they won't, women can go out and do so by talking to others about Jesus, studying with other women. Think about Priscilla with Apollos. She had a faithful husband, her husband Aquila, that went with her. But Priscilla was just as much involved as Aquila was. Otherwise, she wouldn't be mentioned. She was a faithful woman who stood for truth in the spite of all of the evils found in Ephesus and a man who needed to be taught more, more accurately the word of God. The final lesson we can learn is women need to have strength of character to encourage men to do what needs to be done when they aren't fulfilling their responsibilities. Deborah needed to encourage Barak to accomplish God's will and did so by accompanying him to battle. Going back to 1 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. In the church today, you sometimes might have men who do not have the courage to lead, or to act righteously. As Christians, women should speak up when something is said that isn't scriptural. Be the Priscilla. Approach the man in order to discuss and perhaps teach him more accurately the way of truth. When something isn't being done that needs to be done, speak up. And if men still won't heed the call, continue to encourage them to fulfill the word of God, especially through your example of fulfilling the will of God. Oftentimes when wrong people see others doing right, they will then do right themselves. 
when men see women doing right, oftentimes they'll emulate. Now that doesn't give women in this situation the right to usurp the leadership role in the church, because we do not have that in the New Testament. But you don't have to follow sinful men to hell. You must do right yourselves. And if the church led by men is unwilling to do right, sometimes if you, you can only encourage so much, and that might mean you have to leave and find another church that will do right. The church needs strong women. <coughs> Needs strong women to encourage men to be strong, to do what is right, and to do right yourselves. It was Deborah's strength of character that led her to convince Barak to do the will of God. The church, as I said again, needs strong women who are willing to do the things God has given them to do and encourage others to do the same. Let's all, therefore, especially the women among us, be strong like Deborah. But we can't be strong like Deborah unless we're Christians in the first place. And we can't become a Christian unless we believe in Jesus as the Son of God who died for our sins, who rose the third day, and who is King today as King of kings and Lord of lords. We can't be Christians if we won't repent of our sins and confess our faith and be baptized for the remission of our sins. We can do that today. We can start today. We can be strong like Deborah today. I'm not ashamed to hold my Lord, nor